Uh, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is a given mm. Mm. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. Tell me it's Wednesday, Ray. That's Ray <laughs> King Birch over there. <laughs> as far as I know, it's Wednesday somewhere. We settled on something. If only yes. Congress could agree on these things. Yes, right, right. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to talk about environmental finance today. And actually, this actually, Ray, this relates to, uh, in, a, in a way, something that also happened in Florida, namely the, you know, the collapse of that building. Correct. We're, ta we're talking about, uh, you know, literally thousands, if not millions of condominiums around yeah. the country, all right. of whom are 40 plus years old and who need to have serious renovation done to uh, avoid what happened in Florida. Right. And um, <clears throat> how do you finance that? The people in these uh, condos are not necessarily rich. Uh, they Some of them are on fixed income. Uh, you come around and ask them for the money to rebuild the condo and reshore it in some way, uh, do the necessary maintenance and repair to avoid those accidents. Um, it's infrastructure money. And, and the question is, uh, or, you know, where do they get that from? Banks are going to lend it. I'm not sure. Maybe the federal government should have a program um, to help. Maybe, maybe Joe Biden's infrastructure bill could help them out. But the right. bottom line is, in this country, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of financing arrangements to make. The federal government is very important in this, and so is the banking system. And that's what you're working on, right? Right. Uh, we're trying to bring some sort of academic rigor and teaching to the idea that environmental sciences and environmental conditions are connected to the financial system. And basically, that's not being done in academia right now. It's been created outside of academia. There are a lot of insurance mechanisms and financial market mechanisms for funding, environmental cleanup, environmental risk management, and so forth. It's a high-tech kind of uh, you know, subject, and we want to bring academia into the cutting edge of that. And going to what you just said, I mean, the, the city of Miami mayor some time ago said he can't afford to ignore climate change. He's got $200 billion worth of real estate in the city of Miami exposed to climate change. And the amount, this magnitude of risk far exceeds whatever money they can raise locally. They have to go in to the global capital markets to try to solve this, this risk management problem, whether it's to rebuild, relocate, or just shift the risk somewhere else and, and wait for uh, you know, a disaster that requires cleanup. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to approach it, and it's going to take some real informed debate. That, that combines scientists and the financial industry. And they, they need to be able to have some common ground on how they're going to discuss that and not just talk about it, what they know from their own separate but important uh, industries and disciplines. I just uh, finished making a, a short film um, <clears throat> on the, the fact that climate change is an existential threat. We all know that. And it's getting worse. You, know, um, you look at the uh, wildfires, you look at the floods, and now the heat waves in the Pacific Northwest. And it's so clear these things are directly connected and we have to do something. And it's, right. it's not just, um, you know, after the fact, it's not adaptation. We have to go to the root cause and fix it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, people have this, you know, perpetual conversation about raising public awareness over the, the, the threat presented by climate right. change and what it's going to do to us, what it is doing to us. But what they don't talk about, this is why I really admire what you're doing, what they don't talk about is, is actually doing it. And why is that? Because they don't have the money and yeah. they don't know how to raise the money. Right. And, and we really, all, all, all we can have is a perpetual talk fest yeah. unless we figure out how to raise the money. That's why you're right in the center of the stream on this. Yeah, we're, we're in the center, but we're at the very, very beginning. It's all very preliminary because we haven't studied these things as a combined system. You've got the planet's environmental systems operating and interacting in complex ways, and you've got the human systems. And we think the central issue of the human system is how finance operates and how it funds the actions that connect or react to the environmental systems. And we have to begin that study now. We haven't done that in the, uh, previously. And so we're creating this new program with the idea that we need to know how these systems interact and what the risks are that are involved in this interaction. And then we need to know how 
to model and price those risks so that we can then go out and try to raise the money to manage those risks. And it's, it's, it's a very incipient sort of thing. But uh, basically, you know, the world is moving ahead towards that direction outside of the U.S. And now suddenly with the Biden administration, that we're playing catch up. And there's the whole machinery of government is kind of moving towards this, trying to understand the, the financial and environmental connections and how to make use of that. And so you see a lot of articles now on climate finance disclosure or sustainable finance. That's the sort of thing we're talking about in this academic program. And it'll be an educational program, but also a heavy research program that brings in multiple disciplines to try to figure out what we are dealing with, what we can do about it. Now, let me, let me offer you a, a thought that's not, you know, it's, this is not without complication. On the one hand, you mentioned raising the money. Right. And so you go into the money markets, you go into yes. the banks, you go into to the government, you go in whatever program there might be, philanthropists, whatever program there might be, and you raise the money. And you have to demonstrate to those people that it's, it's a worthy cause. Of course, it's, it's worthy in concept, but is it worthy right. in, in the investment? And I imagine this is something you would be teaching and, and scoping out. Because uh, if I lend you, say, a billion or a trillion dollars to do some major projects to deal with you know, climate change, which is really what we have to do, um, right. I should be I should be showing you uh, the return on the investment. I should be showing you the underwriting possibilities of the repayment of the investment or the loan. Right. Um, this yeah. is very hard because we are in climate change now. There are things that are going to happen to us and our planet and our society that will make it harder to pay this back. You know, right. and so the, the whole money market approach is a little different. When you're when you're seeking big money for a big problem, and the problem may eat up the possibility of of, of repay, repaying the loan, right? Well, you're right, and so you can you can fund local projects, and they probably will work for some period of time. The question we also want to look at is whether business as usual is funding other things that'll overwhelm what you're doing in the short term or the local thing. So that has to be understood. It's not an easy question to figure out, but that's why we're seeing now uh, the Biden administration say, I want a whole of government approach to climate finance. I want to know what the risks are. So he's got the Securities and Exchange Commission hiring people to, to look into this, create a research hub. Uh, they've got the Federal Reserve Board has joined what's called the Network for Greening the Financial System. It's 80 or 90 central banks around the world. All of these different federal agencies are now moving to try to figure out what's going on with climate change and how it affects them, what they can do about it. The Commodities Futures Trading Commission, uh, did I say the Department of Treasury? I mean, it's, it's all going, it's a whole of government approach. And that's a tremendous change. And so, you know, business is, is rushing ahead. The, the estimate is that it may be as much as $40 trillion is now being invested with the, the idea of ESG, they call it, environmental social governments criteria for investment. So it, it's a huge, it's a sea change of, of um, this innovation going on right now. But the standards for what is green and what's effective and what can be repaid, as you as you're talking about, it's not set yet. It's not going to be set until you get, you know, a, a multidisciplinary point of view of what's going on here. It's, it's not enough just to ask the scientists how to do this or, or the financial industry. They've got to be collaborating on this. God, some of these things just that it dawns on me that some of these things that you know that you that you would adopt some of these programs that you would create, they're they're, they're trials. They're test, they're test situations. You know, we haven't worked at this level before in terms of trying to save the planet. Yeah. So you may wind up spending a ton of money on something that is, is kind of ex, experimental and right. may not work. And so right. that, you know, from a business point of view, that, that changes the whole notion of risk and reward yeah. and underwriting. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I suggest from what you've said so far is that this is going to require a complete change in the way we see our society and especially our right. economics. 
you know, right now, Joe Biden is spending trillions to try to just, you know, recover from COVID, uh, recover yeah. the economy, the society from COVID. And, you know, we, we really haven't gotten to the question. We, and we're talking about infrastructure. We'll see. But we haven't gotten to the, the question of putting big money uh, in, into climate change. So, you know, the, the question is, can we afford it? Or putting it another way, assuming we do that, and assuming we spend all this other money on things we have to do, such as recovering from COVID, um, and that's going to change our economy. That's yeah. going to change the way the world works, not only here, but everywhere. I agree. I mean, I think they're going to be, it will come around to a, a, a point of view is, you know, does green, green finance work? Does it produce a superior return? And but that's kind of assuming that you could go on with business as usual if you didn't have green finance. And that's what I think will change. There's going to be a reputational risk. Or there may be actual environmental consequences to continuing business as usual that will wreck everything. That's why we now have climate. I think it's the task force for climate related financial disclosure. It's mandated by what's called the G7, uh, the Financial Stability Board. Uh, it's big in the UK. It's big in Europe. It's coming here. Uh, I mean, you, you can't kind of carve out little pieces of the financial system to work and say, oh, we don't have that in in the United States, but we have it in Europe. So, I mean, it's going to be a uniform system at some point. It of, has to be. Disclosure. You know, in, in Hawaii, um, we, we spent a lot of time dealing with EIS, EISs, right. environmental mm -hmm. impact statements. And, uh, sure. you know, that's that's had an effect on a lot of projects. Uh, and it's cost a lot of money, I must say. Sometimes right. uh, you wonder if it's worth it. But but I think that's old hat. You yeah. know, the whole notion of the environmental um, laws in Hawaii and on the federal level uh, may be outdated. An it's environmental perfect. impact statement that would satisfy today's law in Hawaii's section, or rather chapter 343, may not be sufficient um, yeah. to satisfy the uh, the climate change considerations. Right. So the, I think looking forward, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're thinking about this too, is that the environmental impact statement may turn out to be an environmental and climate change impact statement. You got to yeah. look at both, don't you? It's, uh, well, they're mandating that to say, what are the projections telling you? It's not just, you know, what is the historical data telling you? And that's a complicated legal question. The director of the program that we are, we're creating is an environmental lawyer and he's part of the faculty at, at Florida International University. Uh, it, it's, it's something that he's very interested in because these laws are in motion now about the idea of fiduciary duty of pension funds or you know, public investment funds, whether they can ignore climate change or whether they can just go by the past and say, well, we're only interested in risk adjusted returns and we don't have to worry about climate issues. But now I think, you know, the, there's a lot of legal research coming out that says it's a valid concern. And so who knows how far the changes will, will go. But I think we're in a, a new world. It's now reached a critical point that I don't think it's going back to business as usual, where science is dealing with the impacts of climate and finance is running ahead with risk-adjusted returns on its own without connecting to, to the environment. I think those days are gone. But it could be we're, uh, I mean, I hate to say this, but it could be we're in the perfect storm. Because I think uh, what, what happened with COVID, it made people think again, rethink, and, right. and, and, and be willing to accept the transformational experience coming out of COVID, not, not just uh, in healthcare, but in business, um, and in organizing a society and in, in putting your money where your mouth is and including climate change. I think climate change is going to come back roaring. Why? Because we have been ignoring it in, in the distraction of other things. Yes. And now it's catching up. I mean, you, you'd have to be in space not to connect the, wild, the wildfires, the floods, the droughts, the heat waves. I could go on. Yeah. Um, and, and it, you know, I think it, it becomes obvious in the media. It becomes obvious to people who were not treating it as obvious before that we are being enveloped with the implications of climate change now. <clears throat> so I think we're in for a new time. As I said before, you, you are mainstream in this. So the question is, 
Ray, how did you get involved in this? What, did uh, you wake up one morning and yeah. decide you had a, an obligation? I certainly kind? never, yeah, I certainly didn't plan this over the long term. It just kind of happened a little bit along the way. I had a number of different you know, career aspirations. Uh, started, I wanted to be a marine biologist, and I went to graduate school and studied fisheries biology and came to Hawaii. That was in Miami, yeah, and then I moved to Hawaii, moved to Honolulu, and worked on an aquaculture project. Uh, we raised mahi-mahi at the Waikiki Aquarium for a number of years. And when the funding ran out, I thought, well, I want to go to the MBA program at UH and, and study how marine institutions, organizations, whether they're for-profit, non-profit, raise their money, manage their money. So I, I went to the MBA, uh, MBA program and took a lot of finance courses. And when I got out, I ended up working for a Japanese real estate company. And so that wasn't a planned thing, but it was, uh, that was part of, you know, the big Japanese investment period back in, in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did that for a while. And, uh, you know, I, I saw the bubble and the collapse of the bubble. And I, I moved to Florida and stayed in real estate and was working on hotel properties and took some time off and, and got another degree in real estate capital markets, came back to Hawaii, I was working uh, for a resort developer. And I saw that this mortgage innovation at the time in 2004 and five was creating environmental consequences. There was development everywhere. And thought, well, this is affecting you know, land use change and potentially a, a number of environmental systems. Is anybody studying this? And so I started looking into it. Nobody, no, I'm, nobody in academia was studying it. Nobody would encourage me to study it. I thought maybe I'd get a, a doctoral degree in it. And so I thought, well, nobody's studying it. I reached out to the current, at the time, uh, chairman of the oceanography department at UH, Lawrence Maygard, and he was interested. And so we tried to work on this as an idea for a new, uh, new academic program, uh, but it just, it was too soon, apparently. It just didn't work. And he retired, and so I took the idea to Florida. And, and over the years and years and years, I wouldn't have guessed it would take me this long to finally find you know, the right setting for it. But uh, you know, I saw the connection between environment and finance and through land use and the equations that are used to model financial markets and the equations used in modeling fish populations were so close, I thought. That's curious. And the more I looked into it, the more similarities. And I found out that basically all of this mathematics is it was generated by a guy studying financial markets way back in the year 1900. And it spread through environmental sciences. And now today we use it to use, uh, measure the prices of derivatives. Put, you know, you've heard of put options and call options on stocks. That's the kind of mathematics we're talking about, random motion mathematics. And that's the basis of the beginning of our program. It's kind that's of- pretty, That's pretty sophisticated. Yeah, it's, it's at the cutting edge of things, but it's indispensable. I mean, it leads to use something called, you know, I call them environment-linked securities, like catastrophe bonds, hurricane or flood or earthquake, even pandemic, catastrophe bonds in which uh, you know, a homeowner goes to the insurance company and says, I want to lay off my homeowner risk of a flood or, or windstorm. The insurance company one day says, you know, I'm not comfortable with how much I'm insuring, so I'm going to lay off some of my risk. And it goes into the capital markets and issues a catastrophe bond. And an investor will buy that bond, but the investor has to figure out, you know, what are my risks? Because if there's an a bad hurricane or something, I'm going to lose my money in this bond because it goes to the insurance company to pay claims. So he's got to understand the science and the finance. And it, this is a very important issue because Florida issued the, the world's biggest catastrophe bond, a billion and a half dollars, uh, you know, some years ago. The California Earthquake Authority uses, raises it uh, to uh, raises a billion dollars through this method. Uh, FEMA and, and the NFIP, the flood insurance program, are now issuing. In fact, even uh, First Insurance Company of Hawaii, its parent, Tokyo Marine uh, Insurance Company, issues cat bonds. So, you know, this is a global market that has to understand science and finance together. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to be used as a teaching tool, but also to do 
something necessary for risk management. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a new world. But what about the relationship of, of these catastrophe bonds against insurance? Um, you know, it sounds like sort of the, the flip side of it somehow. Uh, how do they relate? How do they work together? Well, they work together in that the insurer, insurance companies lay off their risk. They say we're not comfortable insuring a million homes. So if there's a bad event, we'll go broke. So we'll sell some of our risk. We will get somebody to say, if there's a bad event, they'll pay us money so we can pay claims. And that's what the investors do when an investor buys a catastrophe bond. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. So now the question also is, uh, uh, you know, this sounds like a very rational, if not scientific, mathematical, uh, AI predictive analysis kind of underwriting. And that's, that's why not, you know, this is yeah, the world we yeah. live in. Right. But query, um, is the government thinking this way too? Is yeah. this, is this going to replace what the government might do or is doing, uh, or is it going to operate only in the private sector and let the government mm, do or not do uh, what comes to mind politically? Yeah. Plenty of debate about that. I'm sure that the insurance industry might like to see, you know, private markets supply the, the risk financing and others may say, well, let's just have a government backed fund of some sort. We'll print the money if need be. But, uh, you know, budgets will have to be arranged according to whatever they decide on this. But as I said, the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, has now raised approximately a billion or a billion three uh, in cat bonds. And this is new. This the first one was issued in 2018. So this is a new sort of thing that they're pursuing. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think it's something that will persist. Yeah, good. But let me ask you this. You know, at the end of the day, these are real risks. Um, and they're likely to be realized, uh, a lot of them, if not most of them. Uh, and that means there will, there will be losses. There will be losses. Yeah. That, and, and, and these bonds uh, will, you know, at least uh, redirect the losses reassign yep. the losses, if you will. Those right. losses will take place and they will affect the economy and the country and the, and the society, our quality of life, um, maybe more or less for right. some, some people, some companies and some places and so, but it will affect all of us. And my question to you is, this is a hard one. How is this, go <laughs> how is this going to affect our economy? Because it will change. Somebody has to undertake the loss. Um, yeah, it will affect our take... economy. Uh, right. you know, can I make personal choices based on my appreciation of that question? Uh, well, we have the risk now. So, I mean, you're absorbing the risk in some way right now. In fact, probably insured risk is only uh, some fraction of the actual total economic risk of these events. So it's the reality today, and the risk is probably not going, and it's not going to disappear. Uh, we might do things to lessen it through mitigation and adaptation, but the risk is there. So how you manage it and how you shift it to willing investors. Now, why would an investor do this, buy this? And it's because you might get a good return. I mean, if he doesn't lose his money, he stands to make something higher than just uh, putting it in a savings uh, uh, treasury bond. But on the other hand, if it's it's uncorrelated with financial market risk. I mean, if there's a hurricane, that's not affected. The probability of a hurricane is not affected by what the stock market is doing going up and down. So it's uncorrelated risk in that regard. If there's a really bad hurricane, it might affect the stock market temporarily or, or for some part of the, the market and so forth. But the idea is it's a diversification tool that appeals to investors. And so it's uh, the first one was issued, first cat bond, back in 1997. And it, um, about $140 billion has been issued. They usually last three years at a time and have to be renewed. Uh, so since their inception, about $140 billion has been in, uh, issued. And it's, it's at an all-time high right now. The interest is very high in investing in these things, but you have to have a sophisticated team that can evaluate the risks and, and put it in, uh, in, you know, invest your money for you, manage your money. And that's not, it sounds like a side effect that we want to have. Namely, as I said, we live in a world of AI and predictive analysis. Yeah. Our mathematics has never been as sharp as it is now. 
Um, and so that this whole market that you are describing, uh, this undertaking of risk and uh, investment, um, it, it sounds like what it will do, what it is doing, maybe what it has already done, is to sharpen people's skills in predicting where that hurricane is going to be. Oh, absolutely. In predicting where the fire is going to be. Talk about it. Yeah, that's a great point, Jay. I think because you know people don't want to invest uh, without having the best skills of, of prediction. So it will drive money into something that might you know create a better return or avoid a loss. And I think that's a that's a great point. You know, they'll have better technology, better uh, you know more demand for graduates and so forth. Yeah, we need to have that because uh, you know it's not just a money market. It's a uh sending FEMA down to the right places. It's yeah. it's having the government ready to act or the military, as the yeah. case may be, or the nonprofits, the, the NGOs, not only here, but anywhere. No, I'm no, sure you can a raise- global market, you know, as you've said. Yeah, yeah, you can you can structure these bonds to spend the money on any sort of, you know, community need, whether it's transportation, whether it's communications after an event, you know, it's, it's housing, uh, it's uh, basically anything. But it's a contingent form of finance, which means it's a risky form of finance, which means there's random motion involved. But it's back to the math and the computers that you're talking about. I think it's very important. There was a story um, yesterday about how the the uh, the moratorium on evictions is going to last probably probably another month, and then nobody knows what's going to happen, and 50 million people are likely to be at risk all at the same moment. Oh. And it, we are dealing with big numbers uh, in 2021 at SEC. We are, we are dealing with situations that involve 50 million people. And so we have to find ways to, to deal with, to predict the risk and so forth. So my yeah. question is actually this. Um, we only have you know, 10 minutes left here. Uh, my question is, you know, why FIU? FIU is international. It's yeah. big. It's in Florida, which is a, a site of some... Um, you know, environmental issues and research already. But tell me why FIU? Well, uh, a number of reasons. Actually, I went there and I know a math professor. He was interested. I approached him. He was a financial mathematics uh, expert. He created a, a master's program in financial ma financial engineering. There's 200 of those kind of programs worldwide. But he was interested in what I was talking about. He, and he saw instantly that this is something, this is the future. You know, you can't just talk about math. Uh, I mean, financial math by itself. You got to now pull these environmental aspects into it. And so he and I began working on this. And FIU has tremendous assets, uh, the environmental assets. It's got this Everglades uh, reconstruction oh, project sure. in its backyard. That's the biggest environmental reconstruction project in the world. Uh, Not without some controversy, of course. Uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's got, you know, Miami is, is basically ground central for any news media article on environmental risk, whether it's pollution in the Biscayne Bay or hurricanes, climate change, sea level rise, uh, you know, it's it's the people that need to keep this on their front burner to figure out how they're going to manage these risks and all of the real estate that's, that continues to be built there. Yes. So and I'm originally from Miami. So, I, you know, I, I, uh, I saw that when I couldn't get the thing going in Honolulu, I moved to Miami and, and started approaching them with it. That's like a great, a great uh, choice, serendipitously a great choice. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it's a great, a great location to to do uh, Europe, um, oh, yeah. and and uh, you know parts east. But right. let me let me ask you this though. Well, Suppose we would love to have UH and, and Hawaii involved in this too. I mean, in well, the future, absolutely. we're looking at some way to make this a, a global thing. That's Asia Pacific. So if you had exactly. if you had both schools in a collaborative arrangement of some kind, why it's good that you're here, Ray, because yeah. you, you you're in a position to set that up. You know. See who the personalities are and all that. Yeah, that's but a very let me exciting ask them, opportunity. Who who is going to attend? Who is going to participate? Who is going to register for the graduate degrees and the like that you see? And what are they going to study in in the classes? How are you going to break this down so that you get you know the the kind of people who will be influential in the years to come? The right. kind of people who are connected or will be connected with Wall Street and 
you know, yeah. a, a capital sources and so forth. Um, how, how are you going to approach that uh, to bring the students and the graduate students into it? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this, the science students now in, in PhD programs, they're studying the random theories of how environmental parameters change, whether it's a fish population that, that goes up and down as I studied or whether it's weather or earthquake risk or flood risk, they're exposed to what's called Brownian motion or random motion. And so there's there's a, a way to grab that and say, not only do you know that, we're gonna show you how that's important for managing our future risks. The financial market needs to know what you know, and you need to be able to talk to the financial markets about basically risk-adjusted, environmentally risk-adjusted returns. So students are going to want to know not just the impacts of science. They want to know what to do about it. This is a solutions-oriented program. But I think it's going to grab a lot of people's interest in because that's the way employers are looking. That's the way government's looking. In fact, the National Academies of Science just came out with a new report that says the, there, there's something called the Global Change Research Program mandated by Congress in 1990. For its history, it's been studying the impacts of global change, environmental change. It just came out and said, enough of that. It, we need to know how we're going to manage the risk, how it's connected with society. And that's basically what we're talking about. The financial system is a way to connect the environmental risks with something we can do about it. And so I think you know the governments are moving toward it, the industries are moving toward it, and the students are going to move toward it, too. They're going to say, yeah. I want to be at the forefront of this new idea. Yeah, I think you're going to find that uh, the students who were dedicated to environmental studies and graduate degrees 10, 15 years ago would be much more likely to, to, to go to this because it's obvious or it should be obvious to them, uh, you know, that this is where the action, this is where some things are going to happen. This is yep. where the action, the action area is clear. Right. It's not just a talk fest. So uh, I guess, you know, the, the question is, uh, is there is the, the possibility of a joint degree or a degree that, that has evolved or will evolve from what we all knew to be an environmental graduate degree to an environmental uh, and call it uh, environmental finance and risk degree? Yes. Our first uh, way of attacking this is to offer a, a graduate certificate of four or five courses that depends on the, the student's background in math, and they can get uh, either as a credit course that they can apply to some further degree, or they can do it as a professional certificate. And that'll probably be up and running sometime late next year, but fall next year, perhaps, uh, we begin teaching that. And beyond that, our hope is, is full-fledged in uh, master's and PhD degrees that have research, intensive research that really push the boundaries of what we know about how these systems interact and what we can do about it, how we design new things that are triggered uh, environmental parameters that trigger financial flows uh, that can help us with sustainable finance. You know, when I, when I attended graduate school at NYU Law School, a graduate program there, um, <clears throat> I found that my, uh, my, my classmates were... Uh, they were all uh, taking courses after hours. Uh, they were all working on Wall Street. Yeah. Um, they were all, um, um, you know, already in the game somehow. Yeah. And this was going to polish off their education and make them give them an advantage they didn't have by just yeah. just working on Wall Street. Right. And I, I suggest that um, you know there are a lot of people on Wall Street right now. Uh, who are in environmental situations uh, in their jobs and professions, and of course in their investments, um, who would really love to take this program? Um, exactly. Would they be Would they be able to do that? Do you see a system by which you can bring Wall Street down to FIU or wherever, or, or have the twain meet? Definitely. And we don't really have to do anything because Wall Street's now moved, or it was until this building collapsed, moving. To Miami. I mean, they're they're escaping for a number of reasons, but they realize now that there are tax advantages and also that you can work remotely. And and so a, a lot of uh, hedge funds and financial firms, big ones, the the glittering names, are moving to Miami and Palm Beach. So this is a special thing that FIU will be the first of its kind to offer this 
uh, in the sense that we're going to look at multiple environmental systems. We're not just going to talk about climate finance or carbon finance. We're going to talk about things that involve, uh, you know, earthquake risk for a different uh, different markets or pandemic risk or re restoring uh, coral reefs, mangroves, and so forth, carbon markets, carbon sequestration markets. So we have a holistic approach to this that's unique, along with the mathematical approach. Well, it's not just big in the scope of it. It's not just big in the dollars of it. It's big in the sense that um, it has all the prospects of uh, actually taking action on climate change and thus doing whatever we can. May I use this term, saving the world? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing, nothing much, just saving the world. <laughs> so you, you, must, you must sleep well and you must feel very encouraged with the possibility of being in this particular space. So Ray, uh, what, what follows? What happens next? And when can we circle back and, and get another, get a status report from you on all the excitement? Well, I'll, I'll keep you informed. I, uh, you know, we're, we actually, uh, we had uh, money that was going to be appropriated by the Florida legislature to keep our program uh, going on a, on a recurring basis. And then COVID stepped in and wrecked university budgets and the state budget. And so it was put on hold, but, you know, we, we may come through again in a, in a future budget or we may find some uh, benefactor to enlarge our ideas and realize our ideas. But we're working on it every day and uh, probably within the next three months or so, we'll have some more news on, on where we're going with, with our approvals of our certificate program and, and the next steps. Well, great to talk to you, Ray, uh, Ray Birch, Ray King Birch, a guy who's going to do a lot, is doing a lot to move from, from talk to action to facilitate real solutions uh, and to change the world in the process. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you, Jay. It was a pleasure. Aloha. Aloha.